Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you in April of 2024 with another edition of Propaganda Watch? That's right. Well, if you can cast your mind all the way back to the beginning of January, January of 2021, you will recall that at that time I released the final episode of Propaganda Watch, Stop Watching Propaganda, in which I announced the end of the Propaganda Watch series and the beginning of the new D program, the Solutions Watch series. And if you don't remember that, maybe you want to go back and re-familiarize yourself with Stop Watching Propaganda. But you will also recall that I did say, I'm not saying I will never do another Propaganda Watch, I'm just saying I'm going to devote my time, resources, energy, and attention towards looking at solutions rather than looking at propaganda. But from time to time, as the situation warrants it, I will put out an occasional episode of Propaganda Watch. Well, guess what, folks? The the occasion certainly does warrant it, because I have come across a piece of propaganda so, so weird, so puzzling, so self-contradictory, so annoying, so confusing, so weirdly self-deconstructing that I felt compelled to create the first edition of the Propaganda Watch series in three years in order to deconstruct this. What a wild ride it's going to be. So, for all of you who are wondering what I'm talking about, feast your ears on this wet, hot dumpster fire of nonsense. What's good, y'all? You're listening to Code Switch. I'm Gene Demby. And this week, we're bringing you an absolutely bananas story. It originally aired last year on Code Switch back in 2023, and it involves two things I find fascinating. Race, obviously, that's why we're here, and conspiracy theories. And in this case, a particularly unpalatable conspiracy theory. That little joke is going to make a lot more sense in a second. But to tell this story, I had to tag in some help from one of my colleagues here at NPR. She's on the disinformation beat. It's reporter Huo Jingnan. Jingnan joined me to talk about this theory, which involves everything from white anxiety to climate change denialism to xenophobia and anti-Semitism. It's a lot. It's a lot. And she told me that the conspiracy theory goes that... Global elites are plotting to force ordinary people like you and me to eat bugs. Wait. What? To eat bugs? Yeah, I okay. know, I know. Yeah, what? That's how I started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, my friends, that was the beginning of a 35-minute odyssey down the propaganda rabbit hole of National Petroleum Radio's Code Switch podcast, which aired a report last year, kindly repeated for the audience last month, on the Eat the Bugs conspiracy theory that those racist, right-wing, anti-Semitic, reactionary trolls on 4chan are spreading these days, or something like that. And I think even just from that opening minute, we can tell a number of things about this podcast. Firstly, does that joke about this conspiracy theory being unpalatable actually play on the idea that eating bugs is a bad thing and something that a lot of people in the audience would find gross? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. If that inherent self-contradiction again, broached in the opening minute of this podcast, didn't set off some alarms for you. Just keep that in the back of your mind, because I think that might play into the way that this fascinating and bizarre train wreck of a propaganda piece unfolds. But secondly, uh, Wo Jing Nan. Why did they go with Wo Jing Nan as their expert to decode this conspiracy theory for us? Is it is it because she spent her time during the scandemic lockdowns, analyzing air monitoring data to discover, did it, did it make the air cleaner? Wow, what a wonderful thing. Or, or why do governments have different face mask guidelines anyway? Uh, no, I mean, those things certainly do burnish her credentials as an establishment toady who is willing to parrot anything uh, that the establishment tells her to in order to further the Great Reset agenda. But, I don't know, Wu Jingnan, I have a feeling that her ethnic heritage and culinary background might come into play at some point during this podcast. Let, let's see if that plays out. Uh, thirdly, how many globalist buzzwords can you insert into a single sentence to let the well-trained NPCs in the NPR crowd know that you do not want to go here, that this is every red alert, alarm, red flag that we've implanted in your brain over the years to let you know that this is a bad thing that you must not think about. So, so let's see, how did she describe the 
Eat the Bugs conspiracy again. Uh, uh, it involves, quote, everything from white anxiety to climate change denialism to xenophobia to anti-Semitism. <laughs> wow. Four, four points in a single breath. Good job, whoa. Um, fourthly, are, are we supposed to believe that, that Gene Denby, the host of this propaganda piece, is not only not aware of the conspiracy theory surrounding the Eat the Bugs agenda, but is not aware of the Eat the Bugs agenda itself? Really? Okay, so he's gonna he's gonna play the I don't I've never heard of this wild crazy thing that people on the internet are talking about role and and let's see how they ro walk that tightrope that you know they are going to walk between this isn't happening you crazy conspiracy theorists it's not happening it's not happening it's not ha but you know maybe it is happening and it should happen and if you don't like it you're racist <laughs> let's see how they walk that tightrope without falling off when the host has already <laughs> shown that he's hesitant even with the idea of bug eating L let's see how all of this unfolds uh, i think we're going to be in for a wild ride okay let's take this piece by piece okay global elites mm -hmm. that is you know uh that's been kind of a wink toward this old anti-Semitic idea that they're like Jewish financiers who are secret puppet masters running the world from behind the scenes, yep, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And there's more to the theory than just this wing. To give you a taste of what this looks like, let me take you across the Atlantic to the Netherlands. Okay, to the Netherlands. Um, hmm. Let me just grab some clogs, make sure they match my tinfoil hat. You know what I mean? You gotta coordinate. You gotta coordinate. Oh, God. It's gonna be one of those podcasts, isn't it? They, they really do talk to their audience like like they're Sesame Street Muppets teaching ABCs to ADHD-riddled kindergartners on TikTok. It's insulting, genuinely insulting to me and my intelligence to hear this kind of nonsense patter. Oh, we're going to Netherlands. I better get my clogs. Got to coordinate. <laughs> God, it's just garbage. And... The saddest part is they probably do know exactly the mentality of the audience they're talking to and how to best tailor their communication to suit. Anyway, let's power on. I'm sure there is value to be gained from this exercise. Okay, I want to show you this video. So this is a leader of a far-right populist party in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. The guy's name is Thierry Baudet, and he's speaking at a protest of Dutch farmers. The farmers are protesting against a European Union plan to cut nitrogen emissions that could involve the Dutch government buying out meat-producing farms with high emissions. Hmm, okay, so in this clip, uh, this guy, he's holding in days is up. a plastic bag of something, Het food sold that like one of those bags of granola or jerky or something like that. And now he's dumping them out onto the stage. But wait, 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 wait. Ik heb hier een zak. Mealworm. He said mealworms? That is indeed what he's saying. Mealworms? Like the, the little wriggly larva joints. Yes. Okay. They're the second part of the beetle's life cycle. And just a few months ago, the EU said it's okay for mealworms to be in human food in Europe. Uh... So they're often ground up or dried and roasted as snacks. And I think those look like whole mealworms. All right, so um, I'm supposed to be a dispassionate NPR journalist here at Jingnam, but I am screaming right now. Oh, my God, I'm so good. I'm never eating a mealworm, I promise you. Y'all can have the mealworms, that's people. It's all y'all. Y'all good. No way! Okay, so you agree with Thierry Baudet. <laughs> I guess I do. This is fascinating stuff. Okay, I will interject here simply to note that NPR ostensibly has two aims for this entire propaganda puff piece to even exist. The, the two things that they are ostensibly trying to do. Number one, to make fun of those crazy, stupid, conspiracy theorist knuckle-draggers who are also anti-Semite, misogynist, reactionary white supremacists or something along those lines, for believing that there is a global conspiracy to make you eat the bugs. And two, that, well, you should want to eat the bugs, and it's a good thing that our Davos elitist overlords are encouraging us to do so. <laughs> and uh, note that so far, we the only thing we've actually established as a fact is that the EU has, in fact, approved mealworms for human consumption, and that the <laughs> the host of the program is thoroughly disgusted by that fact. <laughs> this is <laughs> so fascinatingly bizarre. L let's keep going. 
and other conservative media personalities in America talked about edible insects too. Here's Alex Jones on his streaming show, Infowars. Coming food crisis recommends more sustainable diets of wait for it, fly larva, fly larva, fly larva. You're letting the globalists train you to be a slave. All of this is alien to the normal way of life. And Michael Knowles hosts the show at The Daily Wire. I don't want to live like a peasant in the middle of some jungle in Vietnam. I want to live like a civilized person with the cultural inheritance. I'm not going to eat the bugs. The bugs are gross. All right, there you go. There you go. I was waiting for it. Mm. You know, we all know un-American, I'm putting my air quotes, mm. is kind of a dog whistle, right? That last clip kind of lays bare the subtext. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, okay. Can we just, for, just... Is this bug thing even real, though? Like, what exactly has them so agitated around eating bugs? Like, what's going on? It's not that big a deal, actually. You know, using bugs as an alternative protein source for people has been floated by some environmentalists and some entrepreneurs who want to sell, like, cricket protein powder. Okay. But it's a tiny, fledgling market in the U.S. Like, currently, it's often more expensive than beef. Wow. But mostly experts focused on climate solutions are just saying that we need to eat less meat, like not switch into bugs. Huh. So I've, I've seen some of those stories about, you know, eating bugs to help save the planet. Um, again, that's not my journey. Uh, we're not eating bugs on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointing. Um, oh. <laughs> so uh, if it's not that big a deal, like why are folks like Thierry Baudet in the Netherlands and Tucker Carlson here all up in arms about it? What is happening? Okay, let's take a moment once again to note the incredibly odd tension that is happening here. Listen to these weird right-wing conservatard, conspiraloon, redneck, anti-Semitic trolls who are making this weird vow not to eat the bugs. Also, y'all can have the mealworms. We're not eating bugs in this episode. (laughs) And also, also, eating bugs is totally not a big idea. Why are people upset about this? (laughs) It's just... The strangest mishmash of confused, mixed messaging propaganda going on here. But I'm sold. I'm all in. I'm all ears at this point. Tell me, how do they thread this particular needle? Well, right now, it may be because it has become part of an even bigger conspiracy theory. Hmm. I did some digging on the internet, and this merging seems to have begun with this anonymous blog post in 2019. All I could find out about the person who wrote it is that they call themselves a white identitarian. So they're a white supremacist of some sort. Yeah, and you have the tweets to back it up. (laughs) Oh, that's right. They're going to do the old fact checker trick. What's the old fact checker trick? Well, you'd know all about it if you remembered episode 381 of the Corporate Report podcast, who will fact check the fact checkers in which I discussed this trick. But long story short, the the trick is to take the stupidest, most easily debunkable, nonsensical version of a conspiracy adjacent claim that you can find or dig up on some old abandoned Facebook feed or on some Insta account that has 12 followers or something like that. And then you take that as the exemplar of this conspiracy theory that people are parroting and you boldly tear it down in front of everyone. See, this is just as flimsy as a strong man. (laughs) I wonder why. Yes, that is exactly what they proceed to do in this report. So as it turns out, who would have known it? But yes, the entire, not the eat the bugs agenda, the the disgust surrounding that agenda, all of this. Yes, the entire thing sources back to some white supremacist living in his mom's basement with 12 Twitter followers. (laughs) Yes, thank God for those NPR crack reporters for tracking this down and finding the post that started all of this five years ago and how it was mostly nonsense and then taken up as a joke and now people are taking it seriously. They're so, these rubes. They're so dumb. They're not like the smart, switched-on, clued-in, metrosexual jet set of the NPR crowd, let me tell you. You guys are the real galaxy brains out there. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I will I will exhort you in your own time, if, if you can stomach it, haha, pun intended, 
Go and listen to this full report. We're not going to listen to the full 35-minute report here. But yes, you can find out all about how they how they found the single tweet that started all of this five years ago. Yes, and as it turns out, it has nothing whatsoever to do with the demonstrable, years-long, concerted, coordinated propaganda campaign to get you to eat the bugs. I'm Nicole Kidman, and I am going to eat a four-course meal of bugs. Earlier this year, the United Nations held a global conference on the benefits of eating insects, even suggesting it might be a good solution to world hunger. I don't know why the United States doesn't eat insects when they're actually very healthy for you. So, we need to figure out why is this such an issue in people's minds? Why is this a taboo? Well, as children, we're taught that it's gross, it's disgusting. Stay away from the bugs, they're going to hurt you, they're poisonous. And in most cases, that is absolutely wrong. And to prove this point, 80%. That is the amount of people around the world that are eating insects as a daily part of their diet. See, Western culture is the fringe on this. And if we just change the way that we think about our food, we can change the way that we feed the planet. The farmers of tomorrow are the engineers of today. We've created specialist chambers to look after the insects and their different life cycles. We can stack this four meters high and as many kilometers long as you like. We have automation systems that are modulated and run by themselves 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in any environmental condition. And that's vitally important to feeding a growing population. I mean, we don't talk enough about how much these guys are a superfood, but I would say insects are definitely a superfood. Super nutrient dense, just a whole lot of nutrition in a really small package. We're in the middle of a biodiversity mass extinction, and we're in the middle of a climate crisis, and yet we somehow need to feed a growing population at the same time. We have to make change, and we have to make big change. See? The idea that there's some sort of coordinated campaign to get you to eat the bugs is just some ridiculous idea dished up for the gullible rubes by conspirator adjacent redneck white supremacists. And you're an idiot for believing it. Also, you should want to eat the bugs. <laughs> and here's some reasons why. Yes, okay, I will save you from the full point-by-point -point critique and in-depth analysis of this full 35-minute podcast. Um, I don't think either of us <laughs> are willing to go through all of that. But let, let's just listen to some of the lowlights of this propaganda fest, including this part where they, they deconstruct that whole Great Reset conspiracy thing that people are talking about by talking about how it's not... See, it isn't some secret global system being run from the shadows by an unelected bunch of elitists at Davos. No, 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 no. Dude, it's just like vibes that they put out at Davos, man. All right? Just chill. <laughs> what, you think I'm joking? The globalist is a great reset. The great reset? It's what's behind all of this, he says. The great reset. I mean, that sounds very ominous. Yeah, yeah. right? But his name comes from this very confusing initiative by the World Economic Forum, like this group of veritable global elites that meet annually in the Swiss Alps. The World Economic Forum, that's Davos, right? That's mm -hmm. the big Davos festival convention. I'm not sure what it is. And it happens every year. It gets a yep. lot of attention. Yeah. Yep, that's how many people might know it. Yeah. Uh, if you think the global system is secretly being run by, like, powerful, unelected people who get to set the global agenda, like, this annual meeting in Davos with a bunch of obscenely rich people and thought leaders just kicking it at a closed meeting of some sort. I don't know what they're doing there. That's a big blinking piece of at least circumstantial evidence <laughs> in favor of that argument, right? Yeah, the WF meeting at Davos has captured conspiracy theorists' imaginations for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the Great Reset was this initiative that the forum launched in June 2020, after most of the world went into lockdown because of COVID-19. So the Great Reset was like, full of policy proposals? Uh, it's mostly just vibes. I mean, it's all very vague. <laughs> what is... What is happening? <laughs> this is like a car crash. I, 
I can't look away. <laughs> do, do they think they are they are helping their case here? I just I don't I do not understand this propaganda. <laughs> but maybe it's not for me. Anyway, whatever. Let's cut to the chase. You will eat the bugs. This conspiracy theory is so intriguing to me because it doesn't only appeal to fear, which is classic, but it also appeals to disgust. Like, it's so common and visceral. Like, like racist fear, food disgust is a culturally specific thing with its own long history and backstory. I mean, it is fascinating to me as someone who grew up eating silkworms. So I did some research and found that this disgust, in part, comes from how the early colonizers defined what a who is European or civilized and what a who is not. Hold up, hold up, I'm sorry. You said a lot there, but you ate, you ate silkworms for real? Yes, but... Is that what could you do? <laughs> I mean, yes, I promise I'm not going to try and convert you. Listen, you couldn't. <laughs> We're going to get into who's disgusted by bugs and who isn't after this break. <laughs> Am I having a fever dream here? Or <laughs> just what is this? You're a racist white supremacist if you don't want to eat the bugs. <laughs> Bitch, I ain't gonna eat the bugs and no one's gonna make me. <laughs> I promise I won't try to make you eat the bugs. <laughs> Damn straight. <laughs> well, I genuinely do not understand. What on earth is this? And spoiler, <laughs> nothing really changes by the end of this 35-minute propaganda fest. So to wrap up, there is this broad skepticism of government floating out there, right? And then you add these unstated racial anxieties in the mix, right? Things like, mm -hmm. you know, white status laws because of demographic change. You know, right. all that talk about, this isn't the America that I grew up in. And which, of course, has been a very effective button to push for a lot of American political history. And then, on top of that, you throw in people eating nasty-ass bugs. Not nasty, <laughs> Yes, blogs with the all the unpleasant associations and learn to discuss. All right, fine. Sure, 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 sure. Whatever. <laughs> Plenty of people who fall into all those social demographic buckets associated with higher levels of conspiratorial thinking and are grossed out by bugs will never believe this stuff. Right. The way that people see the world is really idiosyncratic. Okay, yeah, so, huh, right. So there's a larger social context in which these theories can take root. And then there's, like, just human-level stuff that makes certain people just go all in on them. Right, and then the other people use this to get attention and attack things they don't like. So given this stew of discontent and uncertainty we're all living through right now, we shouldn't be surprised if we start to hear more people declaring in the coming months and years emphatically that they, too, will not eat the bugs. This is the biggest train wreck of propaganda I have, I have ever been exposed to. <laughs> I just... Wow. And I'm not going to spoil the whole thing for you, but I promise you, it is all equally as crazy as this. But I think it shows a couple of things. Firstly, it perfectly demonstrates a key propaganda technique that I first articulated way back, what was it, 16 years ago on a crappy old microphone into a beat-up old laptop. Young James Corbett told you exactly this propaganda technique back in 2008. When confronted by something that they don't want you to know, they will first, of course, deny its existence and ridicule anyone who claims that it exists, even if you can see the evidence of that thing's existence with your own eyes. After denying the existence and ridiculing anyone who sees its existence, they will then, and only then, implant the idea that, well, wouldn't it be a good thing after all if it was true? You can see this in the creation of the story about chemtrails. They're not true, you're crazy if you see them, it's just condensation trails. But, well, you know, I mean, we do have this global warming that is, of course, caused by that vile life-giving gas CO2, so wouldn't it be a great thing if we could put up a sunscreen to shield us from the rays of the sun? Which, of course, is what actually drives climate. You'll see this, as I say, again and again and again with so many misinformation operations that it's part of their psychological playbook, guaranteed. You'll see this with the North American Union, deny, 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 but wouldn't it be good? 
and the NAFTA superhighway, deny, 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 deny. But wouldn't it be good? Even 9-11 inside job. Of course, we've already looked at rebuilding America's defenses, which called for a 9-11 event before 9-11 happened. And of course, we have that case last year of a nationally syndicated neocon op-ed writer who wrote that op-ed about how 9-11 was actually a good thing and that we need another large-scale terrorist cataclysm to bring about that type of unity in the country once again. So yes, 9-11 was a good thing, but no, we didn't make it happen, honest. Deny, 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 but wouldn't it be good? Keep that in mind, that is a key piece of this psychological operations puzzle. Deny, 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 but wouldn't it be good? It was as true 16 years ago as it is today, or 100 years ago, or at any time. It is a common propaganda technique, and it would serve you well to know about it. But on a more heartwarming note, I think this craziness from NPR teaches us something, well, something nice to hear for a change, which is that even these NPR lickspittles, people whose entire existence depends on them, mindlessly parroting and regurgitating the establishment line in a way that will be easily accepted and understood, understood and internalized by the normies who listen to this garbage. And with all of the combined resources of national propaganda radio and their handlers and the combined weight of the entire global propaganda machinery and the consensus of all governments and NGOs and deep state spokesmen, all of that, and they still have absolutely no idea how to sell this agenda to you. And so they come up with this self-contradictory nonsense that undermines the very points that they are attempting to make. I don't know how to put it any more clearly than they have just put it for you. It is the clearest indication I have ever seen of the fact that the simple, clear truth is instantly understandable. It, it doesn't take any slick, fancy PR. It doesn't take any, let's get our clogs and go to Netherlands kind of nonsense. It doesn't require anything other than crystal clear communication that could be done by a random nobody sitting in their living room in Japan on a beat-up old microphone. And it doesn't matter if you have the combined resources of the trillion-dollar misinformation, disinformation, propaganda factory and the global globalist consensus behind you and all of that. You still cannot sell a lie. You cannot make the public swallow that lie. So, say it with me, folks, loud and clear so they can all hear us. I will not eat the bugs. Anyway, I trust you can see why I just had to put out this particular edition of Propaganda Watch. Anyway, as you can see, the Corporate Report is back in business, so thank you for staying tuned during this, the short uh, spring hiatus and plenty more material coming out in the near future, including, of course, the continuation of the Solutions Watch series, which is the real point. I hope you will be there to join me for it. And of course, as always, you can find me at CorporateReport.com. Talk to you again soon.